so uh, today I want to talk about the weaponization of the First Amendment, and I really have two senses in which uh, I want to. One who's talking. I have two senses in which I want to talk about weaponization. One, weaponization at the Supreme Court, uh, and on also uh, in state legislatures. Uh, at the end, I'm going to uh, conclude with a proposal. Uh, that we should stop punching down against students with a, uh, an analogy to the heckler's veto uh, and instead flip the script to treat intentional provocations more like fighting words. Okay, so all free speech claims are political claims. Uh, not every free speech claim is a good or defensible claim. Some of them are, some of them are not. Support for the First Amendment and for free speech is broad uh, but shallow. Many elites express support for freedom of speech uh, because they know that's what they're supposed to say, uh, but without any really firm commitment uh, to the principles of freedom of speech. It's perfectly okay to be skeptical about people's motives when they invoke free speech. That's, I think, important. Uh, it's not a get out of jail free card. We should scrutinize people's motives. Um, First Amendment law traditionally protects a robust public debate about issues. The goal generally is to foster democratic deliberation about issues of public importance. Uh, the goal is often to discover the truth or the best public policy through a marketplace of ideas. These are the traditional First Amendment arguments that you see. Uh, the idea is we protect individual speakers in order to um, have a diverse debate uh, with many points of view represented uh, in the discussion. This expects a lot out of listeners as well as speakers. It uh, expects a lot out of uh, bystanders and audiences. It can be very demanding at times. Um, First Amendment cases are always about balancing values, uh, values like security versus democratic deliberation, artistic expression versus norms of decency, uh, and so on. First Amendment law, just full of balancing tests, full of trying to figure out how values interact with each other. Um, Above everything, First Amendment law and doctrine protects political speech and speech related to politics uh, uh, and public policy. Um, so it protects things really strongly like criticism of political leaders, criticism of public officials like faculty and administrators, uh, criticism of, of policies and directions and actions uh, by uh, government um, actors. Uh, and the most often prescribed remedy for bad speech is more speech. So all this is kind of a summary of of what First Amendment laws look like. It should sound really familiar um, as we go. Uh, and, I, and I go through this summary because the right to free speech is really popular. There's a large accumulated body of legitimacy and goodwill for freedom of speech. It's something that when people invoke it, carries with it a whole lot of meaning uh, for people. It carries a lot of weight. Uh, and that legitimacy and that reservoir of goodwill is something that I want to focus on here because I think it's what's at risk when we weaponize the First Amendment, when we use it to advance other kinds of goals uh, than these that it has traditionally been used for. Um, the status and legitimacy of free speech was hard earned and we need to uh, take care to make sure that we're not frittering it away or allowing some to undermine it uh, with other kinds of goals. Um, I think many appeals to free speech today are actually rhetorical efforts uh, to uh, tap the wellspring of legitimacy, if you want to use that kind of a metaphor, um, to take the popularity of freedom of speech and use it for unpopular ends. Uh, I think that that's really a problem. If free speech becomes associated in the public mind with nothing more than defenses of white supremacy or the subordination of women, uh, then it's going to undermine that legitimacy. It's going to damage freedom of speech overall uh, in ways that we should be worried about. A um, couple other points before I talk about weaponization. Uh, you'll hear people talk about civility a lot. Civility is not a First Amendment value. Virtually every important First Amendment case that drove the doctrine forward is protecting people who are being demonstrably uncivil. Uh, people who are using offensive language, people who are um, uh, attacking uh, people in power who are using symbols in ways that were disfavored. Um, so civility is not a First Amendment value. It may be a value of academic discussion. It may be a university value. It may be something that's important kind of adjacent to First Amendment values, but in and it of itself, the, there are no, I can't think of any First Amendment cases that require civility. Um, uh, good manners, 
that's different, right? Being a good person that might uh, involve civility in different ways. Um, and so we want to be cautious when people with power invoke civility. They're again trying to draw on the legitimacy of freedom of speech with this free speech adjacent value. But what they're often trying to do is shut down people with less power who want to criticize them. Uh, and so we want to worry about the way that civility discourse is used to exert power and assert hierarchy or maintain and reproduce hierarchy. A um, few things there to think about. So, first, weaponization as a matter of constitutional law. The um, Supreme Court has taken a sharp rightward, rightward turn in the 21st century. Um, Republican presidents have appointed 16 out of the last 20 justices over the last 50 years. Um, current uh, uh, political scientists and, and law professors have done some simulations trying to figure out the next time there might be a Democratic majority on the Supreme Court. They came up with 2065 as the most likely time before there would be a Democratic majority. So the court has moved very rightward um, in terms of measurements of the court's ideology. It is well to the right of uh, American voters, it's actually well to the right of the typical Republican voter. Uh, so it's a very conservative body right now. Um, the Trump appointments gave conservatives a six to three majority. It's quite um, a sticky majority in a lot of ways. That is, they tend to stick together with Roberts being the one that will sometimes uh, go over with the liberals. Um, this majority is more ideological and more partisan than we have seen in past courts. Uh, and that's uh, starting to have some effects. And so one area um, Justice Kagan, right, who's one of the Democratic appointees, one of the court's liberals, uh, she wrote a dissent in the Janus versus SME CME case in 2018. That was the, the case about uh, public sector union dues, right? So it was a union case, uh, but it was decided on First Amendment grounds uh, to restrict uh, the ability of public sector unions to get um, uh, mandatory uh, dues paid uh, from, from employees or automatic. Uh, dues paid. So it was, it was a loss for organized labor, uh, but it wasn't so uh, easily uh, seen as a free speech case uh, in this way. And so Kagan writes uh, in her dissent in Janus, there is no sugarcoating, sugarcoating today's opinion. The majority overthrows a decision entrenched in this nation's law and its economic life for over 40 years. As a result, it prevents the American people acting through their state and local officials from making important choices about workplace governance. And it does so by weaponizing the First Amendment in a way that unleashes judges now and in the future to intervene in economic and regulatory policy. And she goes on to outline ways in which the First Amendment is being used by the conservative majority in the court to go after economic regulation uh, policies that don't really directly relate to speech. Uh, and she criticizes this because, she, as she points out, um, uh, speech is everywhere. It's a part of every human activity, employment, healthcare, securities, trading, you name it. For that reason, almost all economic and regulatory policy affects or touches speech. So the danger, right, once you weaponize the First Amendment to go after economic policy, you can find a speech element in virtually everything that people do. Um, it's there all the time. Uh, we, you know, we, we've been seeing this lately in uh, 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 people trying to defend Donald Trump in some of his cases. What, there's no free speech. He can't threaten people. Uh, he can't do this and that. Um, it's like, well, but speech is often the evidence in a criminal trial, right? What people say is evidence of intent, evidence of motive, um, evidence of a conspiracy. Uh, if you apply free speech and say you can't use people's words against them at all in evidence, you're going to have to empty out the prisons, right? Um, because it's, convictions aren't all based on physical evidence. Uh, speech is involved a lot. So that's Kagan's position and that, the way she's treating weaponization. Now, it's possible this is just sour grapes, right? Liberals won a lot of free speech cases in the 1960s and the 1970s. Um, uh, it's pretty clear that, you know, speakers on the liberal side were often um, the, the winners in those cases. Um, legal activists from the left were often representing them uh, in those cases. Uh, and so there was kind of a track record. But even in the Rehnquist court, which was a conservative court, you still saw uh, liberal speech protected at a pretty good rate, but things have really moved, right? Uh, up through the Rehnquist court, we focused on individual speakers. We focused on protections for political organizing, protections for political dissent, uh, protection for civil rights, anti-war protests, things like that, um, uh, non-conforming speech of various kinds. But uh, in recent years, uh, during the Roberts court, say from 2005 to now, we've seen a move from 
expression cases involving individual speakers uh, uh, and, and often from the left to protecting businesses and corporate speech, very different kinds of cases um, as, as we go through. And so the most common uh, kinds of cases uh, in uh, recent years, the, the bigger headline grabbing free speech cases have been wins for corporate speech. Um, and the percentage of cases dealing with with liberal speech has gone down and down. And under the Roberts court, it's only about 35% of cases, um, according to data by uh, Epstein, uh, Quinn and Martin. Um, uh, they compiled data on all uh, freedom of expression cases from 1953 to 2017. And so they can track this development. We can see as it's moved away from individual speakers towards corporate speakers uh, and so on. It also correlates very highly with the ideology of the justices. Um, the liberal justices uh, tend to side on the side of freedom of expression and the conservative justices against. It's a pretty strong statistical relationship. So this weaponization of the First Amendment in, in constitutional law uh, portends some pretty significant consequences uh, for upending uh, all kinds of uh, government regulation, uh, economic regulation, the relationships uh, uh, that people have in uh, within the economic uh, sphere. Uh, it's a real change in focus from what we're often thinking about when we think about the First Amendment, public deliberation, politics, public policy, things of that nature. That seems to be the older era of First Amendment law. Um, and so uh, if Kagan is correct, we've really entered a new age of, of what the First Amendment means to the Supreme Court, but I'm not sure the public is caught up yet to what is going on there with, with, with the court and the way that they're changing the way that they think. Um, and I think that this comes back to the question of legitimacy where the Supreme Court majority right now is consuming the accumulated legitimacy of free speech law and, and First Amendment doctrine to advance a policy agenda that doesn't have very much to do with speech, right? So they're taking a resource. The, the power of the Supreme Court is its legitimacy. That's what it has going on. Uh, and they're, they're, you know, that's their political capital. And they're spending that political capital uh, in ways that uh, uh, depart from the earlier cases. So that's one sense of weaponization. That, you know, Kagan's language there about what the court's doing. I think a second sense of weaponization that I want to talk about is what's going on with state legislation uh, and academic freedom around the entire country, right? Uh, we're seeing it in multiple states, Ohio, certainly one of them, North Carolina, Florida, um, uh, Missouri, uh, you know, kind of all around. Um, North Carolina has uh, kind of uh, tried to lead in, in some of these areas. Florida has tried to lead in others. Um, and one of the things you find when you look at the state legislation, it's extremely similar. States aren't coming up with this on their own, right? These are not independent events. These are part of an organized campaign across the country. Uh, coming from specific activist groups uh, who are looking to uh, legislate what's going on on university campuses. Um, so uh, even things like intellectual diversity centers, these are not original to Ohio. Um, these, these are going on in other states as well. Um, so we can look at some of the ways I think that uh, uh, free speech and, and First Amendment doctrines being weaponized in these areas, curriculum mandates um, that we see in some of these laws, banning certain subjects from being discussed uh, in class or being discussed in certain kinds of ways in class, um, the creation of intellectual diversity centers uh, at various universities. Um, legislators are inserting themselves into campus debates. They're micromanaging curricular decisions that should let rest with faculty uh, or at, at least with the administration of universities uh, and to very particular kinds of ends, right? Um, they, they have specific goals. And so, I want to just talk about intellectual diversity a little bit as a phrase, as a slogan. Um, really, these two words together, intellectual diversity, are a conservative slogan uh, to co-opt the diversity rationale that's commonly understood at universities, right? Um, this is very intentional use of language to try to take diversity, which is a thing we've been talking about on campuses ever since the 70s, uh, and, and change its meaning to something very, very different, fundamentally different from what we've been talking about over that time. Um, the call for uh, supporting intellectual diversity is largely a moral panic without very much evidence to support it. Um, proponents, for instance, will usually start with some sort of a tale of woe, something like uh, the lack of respect for divergent opinions is increasing at an alarming rate. And we have to do something right away uh, to solve this problem, right? Um, and uh, there's not much evidence actually put forward 
for this uh, this claim uh, that uh, the, the problem is worsening or increasing at an accelerating rate or that it's out of control uh, or out of hand. Um, they will usually point at some incidents of deplatforming. Deplatforming is when uh, a speaker is disinvited, uh, who's been invited to speak on a campus or prevented from speaking somehow. Um, or they will point at students being uncivil in objecting to certain speakers, um, not being quiet in the audience or um, trying to disrupt an event or something like that. Um, they will sometimes look at a small number of conservative faculty who get canceled, which often means they get uh, investigated for a while, nothing happens to them. Sometimes more happens, but often those those cases are, are exaggerated in certain ways, but they rarely look at the faculty, usually adjuncts and part-timers and contingent faculty uh, who get fired for liberal positions uh, or for critical statements about administrators. Um, that's a very common thing, but it never really gets included uh, in these debates about intellectual diversity. We're not concerned about uh, an adjunct who uh, uh, makes an administrator angry by by posting something critical. Um, this argument generally is also grounded in a deep seated belief on the right that faculty indoctrinate students. Uh, again, without providing uh, providing much evidence of indoctrination happening. My argument as a faculty member is if I can't indoctrinate students to come to class or do the reading, I sure as hell can't get them to change their fundamental worldviews, right? Um, so indoctrination to me just in my experience as a faculty member, sounds quite fishy. Um, I think that uh, conservatives have been making these arguments since the 1960s, at least. Um, and if this had been an ever increasing uh, phenomenon, surely liberals would have won by now. Uh, surely uh, all this debate would have been over uh, and settled. But we're having the same debate we were having when I started graduate school in the 90s. Uh, basically, right? It's still the PC debate from the 90s. It's just rehashed, a little bit different language being used, um, but uh, it's not much different uh, from what's happening there. Um, and in fact, some of the really active people, I looked down the list uh, of uh, the signers of the so-called Princeton principles uh, about uh, free inquiry on campus. And uh, the Princeton principles are kind of a scam because they're not actually uh, approved or sponsored by Princeton University. It's just some guys at Princeton put them out uh, and said it's the Princeton principles. And I, and I looked down the list and, um, you know, it's some of the same old people who uh, have been doing this for, for decades and, and um, uh, it's, it's, it's not very new. All of this is about power, right? All free speech claims are political claims. They're all claims uh, about power uh, and power often settles who wins these battles. Uh, and that's what's going on here. Um, terms of evidence uh, for uh, deplatforming. So deplatforming is a bad thing. People shouldn't do it, right? I mean, I, I can say that, but also there are 4,500 colleges and universities in the country. There are thousands of speakers on campuses every week in this country. Deplatforming is very rare, right? It doesn't happen very much. Uh, and so, you know, people shouldn't do it. But also, we shouldn't legislate based on the kind of a phantom problem that's really not widespread. Um, uh, I think if we look at um, indoctrination, it's true. Data shows that uh, more faculty identify as liberal than identify as conservative. And by the way, this is true. Yeah, it's true in humanities departments, but it's also true in natural science departments, right? It's true in engineering. Um, it's uh, often uh, pinned on people in the humanities and the arts, but it's across the academy. Uh, people identify as liberal, um, but that's not evidence of indoctrination, right? Um, indoctrination is something else. Um, proving that people have politics or that there's um, uh, people select academic careers for different reasons. Um, there are a lot of things that could be going on there, and maybe some of them are things we should be concerned about, but it's not evidence of indoctrination that faculty happen to be liberal. Um, uh, it's uh, probably uh, more likely, if students are changing their opinions, that peer pressure and exposure to new people is what leads them to change uh, their viewpoints about things, right? New experiences. Come to college when you're 18 or 19 years old, there's a lot of new stuff that's likely to have effects far more than, than probably what faculty do uh, or what faculty expectations are. Um, I think it's fair uh, to point out that people who, in open, who invite openly racist or anti-Semitic speakers uh, speakers who are going to preach uh, cishet male dominance or something like that, um, people who are known for provoking outrage, 
I think it's fair to point out that the people who invite them are being jerks, right? That they're doing something that we know they probably are doing on purpose. Um, and it's kind of bad behavior um, uh, often. Um, it's fair to point out that intentionally provoking a reaction and then hiding behind free speech, that is cowardly uh, to do that, right? To, to take that accumulated legitimacy of free speech and use it as a cloak uh, to advance, uh, you know, just provoking people just to poke a stick in their eye. That's not smart or clever, right? Um, and so that's that's a problem. I think uh, just asking questions is another thing you'll hear, but just asking questions is a mockery of robust debate rationale. It's a mockery of uh, the arguments that the Supreme Court laid out in the 1960s about a robust public debate. Um, and, and again, it's drawing on the legitimacy and weight of free speech in order to subvert free speech. Uh, in many respects. Um, it's an attempt to use free speech rhetoric to turn deserved criticism uh, uh, on its head and, and use it against the critics rather than defending the decision to invite certain kinds of people, right? Um, that That's a discussion that, that we ought to have. So I wanna kind of wrap up here with some uh, proposals um, and think about this, right? The, the danger is that weaponization of the First Amendment um, for policy goals divorced from individual rights and democracy is gonna destroy the legitimacy of freedom of speech. Um, legitimacy was built slowly over the accumulated decades of activism, litigation, political mobilization, uh, real pain and suffering uh, in many cases, decades of political fights. Legitimacy isn't granted by authority. It's not, First Amendment law, the way we understand it right now is about the same age as I am, right? I'm not so young anymore, but it's it's not that old, right? It doesn't go back to the founding. It goes back to the 60s. Um, if free speech comes to be associated in the public mind, mostly with white supremacy uh, or with male domination and corporate profits, then that legitimacy is gonna dry up. People are gonna stop caring about free speech if they see it only protecting certain kinds of, of, of ideas or certain kinds of people, people who tend to already have a lot of power uh, in society. Um, and so we have to worry about maintaining, fostering, um, you know, protecting uh, the legitimacy of free speech and, and what it means to us and, and how we're going to use it. So uh, quickly, my, my proposals would be we should reconsider the proper analogies uh, for campus speech controversies. A lot of the focus, right, is on um, uh, the heckler's veto and criticizing students uh, who attempt to disrupt a talk as people who are violating uh, our understanding of free speech. But that actually misunderstands the heckler's veto. The heckler's veto doctrine says that it's up to state actors to provide security to protect speakers against disruptions. It doesn't say people can't try to disrupt. It doesn't say people can't criticize the speaker uh, or uh, engage in more speech, right? The, the heckler's veto puts uh, the onus on state officials. In the university context, that would be the university, right? Uh, and university security. Um, so instead of thinking about the heckler's veto, which really just becomes an excuse, again, to punch down against students, uh, and we've seen a bunch of these kinds of talks in the last couple of years, um, we should look at the, the people who are making the decisions about who to invite to campus. If the invitation is designed to cause a reasonable student to react with outrage, then I think it's fair to blame the people who extended the invitation. These are choices that people make, right? Um, Speaking invitations and large honorariums are not available to everybody who might like to address the campus community, right? Um, you know, you can't just sort of put your name uh, in a box somewhere for next Monday's big lecture, right? Somebody's going to invite you and they're probably going to cut you a check. And some of those checks are big, right? I don't get those. So maybe I'm just jealous, but um, uh, that th th they're finite opportunities to address a, a campus community. Um, and not every group on campus has money to pay honorariums to invite speakers, right? That's not something that's evenly distributed. Uh, and so we should think about the people who make the speaking invitations. We should treat aggressive invitations that are designed merely to provoke a reaction as more like fighting words. So instead of thinking about the heckler's veto from First Amendment law, let's think about the fighting words doctrine, where we think that certain words are such that they would make the reasonable person react with violence. That's the fighting words doctrine. I'm, it's a, not a perfect analogy, but I should. I think we should think about, you know, some invitations are just designed to make people angry. They're just designed to cause a controversy. 
Uh, and we ought to think about that as a kind of fighting words, right? Provoking people on purpose is not uh, honorable behavior. Um, and we need to focus always that all free speech claims are political claims. We need to respond to the weaponization of the goodwill and legitimacy of freedom of speech as the exertion of political power that it is and the threat to democratic inclusion and participation that it represents. Thank you. Thank you.